I want to talk to you today about the power of authenticity and to offer up a word and concept covering in the hopes that it might unlock that power for all of us listening today. So I've had some occasion to think about authenticity and coming to terms with my own identity as a gay man. And I think of that journey as moving through three weakening phases of coerced conformity. The pressure to convert, the pressure to pass, and finally, the pressure to cover. So to begin with the power of authenticity and the demand to convert, I want to think back to when I left college and went off to graduate school and finally came to terms with the fact that I was gay. These are very dark times in my life. In fact, the only consistent foray I made from my dormitory was to go to the college chapel where I prayed to gods I wasn't even sure I believed in for conversion because I thought that that was the only way, this is 1991, that I could live a fulfilling professional or personal life. It's very difficult for me to remember that young man knelt down in prayer because he so ardently willed the annihilation of the human being that I have become. To see him clearly is to feel the outlines of my present self grow fainter. It was only after I left grad school and went to law school that I moved from the conversion demand to the passing demand, where I accepted the fact that I was gay, but still masked that fact from others. Unfortunately for that grand plan, this is the first year in the entire history of the law school that it offered a course titled Sexual Orientation and the Law. I desperately wanted to take this class, but I worried that if I did, I would effectively be outing myself to the very tight-knit law school community. So I went to the professor during his office hours to ask for advice, and I thought he would say, you need to have the courage of your convictions and take this class. And that means you're outed, that means you're outed. But instead, he said something quite different. He said, this is a deeply personal matter. You should not come out on any institution's timetable. You should call that yourself. And then he said, I will make a contract with you. If you take the syllabus and you keep up with the readings conscientiously for this class, I will talk to you about those readings whenever you want. And this turned out to be the greatest pedagogical gift I've ever received in my life, because it is where I found my calling. I saw that LGBTQ plus individuals were being fired from their jobs, being denied custody of their children, even being thrown in jail, simply for loving somebody of the same sex or having a non-typical gender identity. And I also saw that the law was a solution to that problem. This is now 1996. The ice is breaking up with regard to what courts and legislatures are willing to do. And by the end of that semester, I was not only out to the entire law school community, but I resolved that I wanted to grow up to be just like my professor, a legal scholar and advocate for LGBTQ plus rights. I wrote up a storm, and 18 months after I graduated from law school, I was hired back at Yale as a junior tenure track professor. And the biggest piece of relief that I felt when I was hired was that I could finally, I thought, stop managing my sexual orientation. Because I thought, I've overcome the passing phase. Every single person on the faculty who raised their hand and voted me in knew that I was gay when they did that. So I can finally stop working my identity alongside my job. This proved to be incredibly naive. No sooner did I arrive at Yale as a junior professor than a very well-meaning, very friendly senior professor put his arm around me as we were walking down the hall and said, Kenji, you'll have a lot smoother ride to tenure if you are a homosexual professional than if you are a professional homosexual. And I knew exactly what he meant. He meant that I would do much better as a traditional constitutional law professor who taught separation of powers and judicial review and just kind of happened to be gay on the side as an extracurricular activity. 
than I would do if I were the gay rights professor who wrote on gay rights subjects, worked on gay rights cases, and taught gay rights courses. Unfortunately, of course, it was the latter, more activist path that I wanted to pursue. But I must admit, such was the terror of the tenure track that for a while I tried to take this advice. And I put myself on mute. I wrote about things that I didn't care that much about. And I was floundering. I was miserable. And finally, I came to the realization that I would much rather risk not getting tenure as somebody who I was than even get tenure as somebody who I was not. So I flipped back over to writing about what I really cared about. And six years later, I got tenure unanimously, flipping even the professor who had given me the advice. At that point, there was only one nagging doubt that remained with me which is what had just happened to me in that interaction when we were walking down that hallway. Because I didn't have a word to describe that third phase of assimilation. I knew it wasn't conversion. This very well-meaning colleague did not want me to become heterosexual. It wasn't even the demand to pass. He didn't want me to go back into the closet. But he did want me to mute, to edit, to manage my gay identity so that I would fit more seamlessly into the predominantly heterosexual environment into which I was being launched. So I did what all academic researchers do when they can't find a word for a problem, which is to cast my net out onto the academic literature. And I found my word in the work of sociologist Irving Goffman, where Goffman says, people who are quite willing to say they belong to a stigmatized group often expend an enormous amount of energy keeping that identity from looming large in their interactions with others. And he called that strategy covering. And when I found that word, it was as if a light bulb went off over my head because I understood so many things about my life that I hadn't understood before. And covering has become an obsession for me in the two decades that have elapsed since I first found that term. So I think it's become an obsession for at least three reasons. First, covering is truly universal. When we're talking about conversion or passing, only certain groups are going to be subjected to those demands. These are the groups that people think have identities that can be changed or hidden. So religious minorities, sexual minorities will be subjected to the conversion or passing demands. But women and racial minorities will generally not be subjected to those demands. Notice what happens, though, when we get to covering. There's interest convergence among all groups. Because covering directs itself not at who we are, but what we do. It directs itself at the behavioral aspects of our identity. And because we can all control our behaviors, we will all be pushed to cover if the identity we hold is outside of the mainstream of our community. And in 2023, I think we all realize that all of us are sometimes going to be on the outside looking in. In 2023, it is not normal to be completely normal along all dimensions. But I can guarantee you that every single person listening to this talk has been subjected to the covering demand at some point in their lives. In fact, in a survey that I collaborated with Deloitte on about covering in the workplace, we found that 83% of LGBTQ plus individuals reported covering. It was 79% of black respondents, 66% of women, all the way down to 45% of straight white men. So I just want to underscore that everyone really means everyone. Even the ostensibly most dominant groups in the workplace reported significant degree of covering. No cohort was immune. The second reason I'm obsessed with covering is because it matters. It hurts. So when I think about my own life, I might not have gotten tenure if I had accepted the covering demand that was made on me. When I think about my personal life, I think that if I had accepted the covering demands based on association or activism that had been made on me, I would not have married my husband. I might not even have children today. And when I think about that, it really sends a chill down my spine. Again, going to the survey, when we asked individuals whether covering hurt, 60 to 73%, depending on the kind of covering in question, said this was somewhat too extremely detrimental to their sense of self. And when asked whether their leaders expected them to cover, 53% said, 
Yes, our leaders did. And of those, 50% said this somewhat to extremely diminish their commitment to their organization. So covering matters because it hurts. And the third reason why I'm obsessed with covering is because it's a fairly sobering wake-up call for me as a lawyer. Because I've learned that law is going to be an inadequate solution to the covering problem. I say this is sobering because I'm still so proud to be a lawyer and I love being a law professor. But my education in the law has also been an education in law's limitations. Law is a blunt instrument. It's a meat act. It is excellent at dealing with categorical forms of discrimination. If somebody fires me for my skin color or for my chromosomes, I will win that lawsuit in a hot second. But law is not good at subtler, more second generation forms of bias like covering. So if someone says, you know, Kenji, stop acting so fresh off the boat, or if they say, Kenji, you're too emotional for uh, a stereotypical man, then if I sue, the outcome is going to be much less clear. So what that leads me to believe is that I really need all of your help, that redressing the covering demand is not a legal project, it's a cultural project. And so therefore, it cannot rely on the tiny subset of us who are lawyers. It has to rely on the faculties of conscience and compassion that inhere in all of us as members of the community. So what do I want us all to do? Let me move to some solutions and calls to action. The first thing I want you to do is to diagnose. As Gloria Steinem once famously said, we couldn't do anything about the problem of sexual harassment until we found the words sexual harassment and hammered them into our public vocabulary. Similarly, with covering, I want you all to use this word, to hold it accountable to your own lives, to ask yourself, am I covering? And if the answer is yes, I want you to ask yourself, does this hurt? And if the answer is yes, I want you to ask, does my community have any justification for imposing this covering demand on me? Because oftentimes, far from having a reason, communities will violate their own values in imposing the covering demand. They'll say out of one side of their mouth, we believe in inclusion on the basis of race or gender or sexual orientation or age or disability. While out of the other side of the mouth, they'll say, cover, cover, cover anything that makes us uncomfortable or anything that makes you different. If it hurts and you're doing it and the organization has no value that would justify the covering demand, then I want you to ask your organizations to do things differently, to be better, to live up to their values rather than simply living under them. The second thing I want you to do is to be better allies to each other with regard to covering. The social science has now made it quite clear that we are much more effective when we intervene against bias as allies than when we intervene as targets of the bias. What I mean by that is if I speak up against bias when I myself am the target of that bias, I will be seen as a whiner, a snowflake, thin-skinned, oversensitive, humorless. Whereas if you intervene on my behalf, you will suffer none of those penalties. So it's a much better arrangement if you have my back when I'm the target and I have your back when you're the target than for all of us to go it on our own. What this means for covering is when you see an individual being subjected to a covering demand, let's say someone walks in for a, late for a meeting and then someone cracks a joke about, oh, you're on Hispanic time today, I see. I want you to view that as an occasion for you to intervene and to stop being a bystander and stop being an upstander in that interaction. Because that individual, the target, is in a terrible position. They can either speak up against the bias and covering demand and suffer all the consequences I just described, or they can duck their head, they can cover and live to fight another day, but they will inevitably wear like an albatross around their neck either for the rest of the day or for the rest of their lives. The shame of not having stood up for themselves or for their group in that moment. So you can take that tragic choice away from them by, and I hope you do this in savvy and thoughtful ways in consultation with the targeted person, by being their ally. The last and my favorite solution to uncovering talent is to share your story. So when we crowdsourced what kinds of changes people would want to see in the survey with regard to redressing. People said as if one vo with one voice, 
please be more authentic. Create a culture where everybody is sharing their stories. And this is particularly true for leaders, they said, because if you don't go first as a leader, we will not go at all. Because we are all looking to you to figure out what is acceptable as a norm of authenticity in this workplace. So the next time you find yourself debating whether or not to lean in to your vulnerability and authenticity in a moment, particularly if you're a leader, understand the huge benefits that you're modeling in doing so. So I'm going to close uh, by taking my own advice and telling you a final covering story from later in my life. The year is 2008. I'm tenured and now chaired at Yale. My husband and I want to start our family in the same city. He's working in New York. So I apply to a bunch of schools in New York. I'm fortunate enough to get a few offers, and then the recruitment season begins. The then dean of NYU calls me up and says, we know that the chair you hold has deep sentimental significance for you. So we looked in our existing roster for a comparable chair and couldn't find one. So we took the extraordinary step of creating a new chair, and we hope that you will be the inaugural occupant. And the new chair, in honor of all your work at the intersection of constitutional law and civil rights law, is called the Earl Warren Professorship of Constitutional Law. Every single people-pleasing bone in my body just wanted to take the chair, which had been offered with all the goodwill in the world. But I knew I couldn't. I just finished writing the book on covering, so I said, I can't take that chair. And he was astonished, and I could tell a little bit annoyed. And he said, why on earth not? And I said, well, as you may know, I'm of Japanese descent. And as you may know, as Attorney General of California, Earl Warren superintended the internment of over 100,000 people of Japanese ancestry without any due process or criminal charges. And I can't be honored with the name of a person who has so dishonored my people. And he said, I get it. Please don't make any sudden movements. I'll call you back in three days. A few days later, he calls back and says, I have a new chair for you. And I said, great, lay it on me. And he said, it is the Chief Justice Earl Warren Professorship of Constitutional Law. So this time, I was the one who was astonished and a little bit annoyed, because all he had done was to take the chair I'd rejected, tack on the words Chief Justice to the front of it, and present it back to me as if it were a brand new chair. So I said, what difference could that possibly make? And he said, in words that I'll never forget, in the intervening days since our last call, I've done some research on Earl Warren. And as Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, who wrote canonical opinions <clears throat> like Brown versus Board of Education or Loving versus Virginia, he said the thing he most regretted was the internment of the Japanese. So he said, whether you call your project diversity and inclusion or civil rights, I see your project as being the project of helping people understand how many different valid ways there are to be a human being, and taking people as far along the maturity curve towards achieving that understanding as possible. And he said, given that that is your project, what better title could you have than the name of an individual who was able to travel so far over the course of a single lifetime, but at the point where he was completing rather than beginning his journey? And I said, that chair I will take. So I stand before you today as a Chief Justice, Earl Warren Professor <clears throat> of Constitutional Law. I thank you for your kind attention, and I wish you all the best in the critical project of uncovering your authentic self.